in Acts 19, and the message is titled, Did You Receive the Holy Spirit Since You Believed? So let's pray. Father, thank you so much, Lord, for your church, for your people, Lord, for this uh, rainy um, Sunday, Lord, as we see the rain and the cold. Lord, we know that all seasons are needed, Lord, and um, we just think about as the rain drops, Lord, we think about the Holy Spirit, Lord, just falling upon us, Lord. We just ask, Lord, for just a fresh baptism of your Holy Spirit, Lord, for your church, Lord, that um, even as the, the rain comes down and gives life, Lord, that your Spirit would just give us life now as we consider your word in Jesus' name. Amen. So here in Acts chapter 19, we see that there were special miracles that happened in the city of Ephesus um, by the hand of Paul. So God did some unusual miracles. And um, what Paul did is Paul spoke publicly from house to house, day and night. So he was uh, engaged in God's work every single day. And Paul supported himself um, through working as a tent maker. We covered that already in previous chapters. And God used this man, Paul, to really shake the foundations of the city of Ephesus and uh, for the gospel. That so much so that even the magicians, even the people that were uh, dabbling in darkness, um, took all their magic books and made a bonfire with them and burned all their, their books when they heard the teaching of uh, the Lord through Paul and they turned to the Lord. So what an amazing revival there. So here in Acts chapter 19, verse 1, it says, And it happened, while Apollos was at Corinth, that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus. And Paul, finding some disciples, Paul said to these disciples, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And I love how the old King James translates it. It says, Have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? So I think that really brings... Uh, a lot of definition as we look through different translations. So there was 12 disciples. Um, just a fun fact that Paul was seen here in Ephesus. Kind of reminds me of Jesus having the 12 disciples and the 12 apostles. But he's having a conversation with these the disciples. And so he asked them if they received the Holy Spirit since they believed. So they answered Paul. And they said, we have not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. We have no idea. We didn't know anything about a Holy Spirit. What's that? So in verse 3, Paul says to these 12 disciples, he says, he asked them a question. He says, and what then were you baptized? And they answered Paul, and they said, into John's baptism. So Paul says, since you believed on the Lord Jesus, so they're believers, they believe, they're Christians, did you receive the Holy Spirit? And that's what the title of this message is, did you receive the Holy Spirit? The Bible does teach that there's a threefold relationship that Christians, that, that humans have with the Holy Spirit. First relationship is one, when the Holy Spirit is outside of a person, uh, outside of an unbeliever, and um, the, the Holy Spirit convicts that person, or convicted us before we were Christians, convicts us of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. So when we're unbelievers and we do something wrong, we, you know, sometimes we call it our conscience, our moral compass, but the Holy Spirit is saying, don't do that. You shouldn't be doing that. So the Holy Spirit is convicting the world of sin, of righteousness, of judgment. The second relationship that a person can have with the Holy Spirit is when they believe in the Lord Jesus. So they become believers. And so we're born again of the Spirit. So the Spirit is not only outside of the person, but now the Holy Spirit comes inside of the person. So we're baptized with the Holy Spirit. So that's the second relationship that we have with the Holy Spirit when we put our faith and trust in the Lord Jesus. And we're born again of the Spirit of God. But there's a third experience that Paul is talking about here with the Holy Spirit that is separate from conversion, but could take place at conversion. But it's a third experience. And that is um, the empowering of the Holy Spirit when... We are empowered to live for Jesus the way he wants us to live for him. So we actually just covered this topic our last Wednesday night at our midweek Bible study. And um, so we call this the, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, or you can call it the overflowing of the Holy Spirit. Um, 
whatever you call it is not really important as long as you're experiencing it. And so um, just uh, as a cup, as you pour some water into a cup and the cup is filled with the water, if you keep pouring and you don't stop pouring, eventually that cup is going to overfill. And we're the cup, we're the vessel, and the Holy Spirit is just being poured into us so much that we're filled to the max with the Spirit, and now the Spirit just overflows from our lives. Now we're just loving people, and we're walking in the Spirit, and we're empowered to actually like resist sin, and we're empowered to actually speak boldly for the Lord, and we're empowered just like Paul was empowered. So uh, Paul saw here uh, that something was missing in these disciples. So the Lord gives us discernment as well as believers in Jesus Christ. Um, if we're baptized with the Holy Spirit, if we're empowered by the Holy Spirit, um, you know, God gives us discernment when we come across other believers. And, um, and Paul was definitely sensed that something was missing in these believers' lives. They, were, they, didn't, they didn't have the full experience that God would want them to have for them. So could it be that something was off with these believers? Possibly. Paul, Paul noticed that something was a little bit different. Um, maybe uh, these, these disciples, maybe they were not as loving as they could have been to one another. Maybe they were lacking love. Maybe the joy of the Lord was not their strength. So hardship was maybe coming into their life and they weren't depending on the Holy Spirit to get through it. Um, maybe uh, they didn't have a drive or maybe they didn't have a passion to, for the loss. Uh, maybe they were just apathetic or they didn't care. Um, to share the good news, to reach a lost and dying world. Uh, maybe it was that um, whatever it was, Paul discerned, hey, there's something more for you, and it's free. God will give it to you if you just ask. So Paul points this out to them. And so God is so merciful, and God blesses these people through Paul. And so they receive the empowerment of the Holy Spirit so they can live the life that God has for them to live. At the end of this service, I uh, would we'll also like to ask the Holy Spirit to um, empower you if you'd like. You can come up for prayer and I can pray for you um, that you may be empowered to serve Jesus to the full uh, capacity that he has for you to be able to um, just live in all that, take all the land that the Lord has for you. And so if you like that, uh, we'll be available here in the front and uh, we will ask, you know, Luke 11 makes it very simple. He says, you as an earthly father, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more will your heavenly father give you the Holy Spirit if you ask? Mm -hmm. So all we're going to do is simply believe the Bible simply. And we're going to ask together, Lord, give us the Holy Spirit and empower, empower us for service. And um, he will do that because he says he would if we ask. And so in verse 4, Paul says that John indeed baptized with the baptism of repentance saying to the people that they should believe on him who would come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid hands on them, on these twelve disciples, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. Now the men were about twelve in all. So in this particular instance, the Holy Spirit baptizes them, and they also received some of the gifts of the Holy Spirit at the same time. Uh, in this case, they received the gift of tongues and they received the gift of prophecy. So tongues is speaking in another tongue and prophecy is speaking forth God's truth. So time doesn't permit us to go into the details of all of the uh, gifts of the Holy Spirit that we find in Romans chapter 12 and 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and Ephesians chapter 12. We're going to have to put that for a later study. Um, however, um, we've been praying as a church and just really seeking the Lord's direction uh, for Wednesday nights as we're finishing up the Calvary Distinctives in a couple weeks here. And the Lord's kind of put in our hearts that maybe uh, we might um, start some type of series on the Holy Spirit. So maybe we'll just take a gift of the Holy Spirit every night and just really focus and really understand biblically what it is, how to... How to use, utilize it if God gave you that spirit and that gift. Um, because God gives us gifts to each one as he wills. Some he gives a couple gifts. To some one gift. To some more gifts. Uh, so we all have different gifts that the Lord gives us. 
uh, of the Holy Spirit for the purpose of the edification and the buildup of the church. So pray for that as we seek God's mind on the direction of our Wednesday night mid midweek Bible study. But for now, what I want to cover on this verse is that the true evidence of being baptized in the Holy Spirit is the agape love. Love is the evidence of the Holy Spirit. Um, this is um, contrary to what some people say, is that only the gift of tongues is the gift of the Holy Spirit. Uh, the gift, the, the evidence that you're saved and that you're a Christian. Not biblically. Um, the gift that you're born again Christian is that you have love. That you care about other people. So that's what it is. And then the Lord gives um, to some he gives tongues, to some he gives prophecy, to other discerns of spirits, and so on. So in verse 8, and when Paul went into the synagogue and spoke boldly for three months. Now Paul had boldness. Why did he have boldness? Because he was empowered by the Holy Spirit. And he actually, even, Paul even actually prayed, pray for me that I may have boldness to open my mouth widely. So he asked for prayer. He knew the power wasn't within him. It wasn't based on his intellect and smarts. It was based on the power of the Holy Spirit. So he spoke boldly for three months. And boldness only comes from the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. And there are times in our Christian walk when we find ourselves bold and we share our faith. And we share the truth in love. And there has to be a balance. But if you're not experiencing that right now, it's so simple for you to experience it. All you have to do is just ask the Lord to baptize you. Even now, even as... We're going through the study. You can pray in, in your mind, in your heart, in your head. Lord, just baptize me with the Holy Spirit. Empower me to be bold, to share uh, about you with others. So because Paul was baptized with the Holy Spirit, he was able to reason. So Paul was reasoning and he was persuading concerning the things of the kingdom of God. And we did talk about that our Christian faith is a reasonable faith. And so Paul was reasoning with people. He wasn't just allowing people to just blaspheme God and say all kinds of bad doctrine and he just stayed quiet. He wasn't just this good little Christian boy who didn't uh, uh, share the truth in love. He, he reasoned with them. Okay, you believe like this, but here's what the scriptures say. So he reasoned with them. He used logic and the Holy Spirit used that and he persuaded. So he wasn't just trying to win an argument. He was trying to win a soul for all eternity. And we need to keep that um, perspective as well and so currently we're God has us living here on earth in the temporal but there's another kingdom which Christians live for and that is the kingdom of God and that's what Paul was persuading the people reasoning with them about the things of the kingdom of God he was bringing their attention that it's not just the physical realm that we live in and for and in verse 9 it says but when some were hardened and did not believe but spoke evil of the way before the multitude. Paul departed from them and withdrew the disciples. And he reasoned daily. I love that. He reasoned daily. This is a daily walk that we have with Jesus. And it's a daily persuasion. As God puts different people in our lives daily. And Paul was daily reasoning. And this is a theme that keeps coming up through the book of Acts. You remember that the Bereans were more noble-minded than the Thessalonians because not only did they receive the word of God from the teacher, but they searched the scriptures daily. And then it says in the book of Acts that Paul reasoned in the marketplace daily. And then here we see that Paul is reasoning daily. And so it's a daily walk with the Lord Jesus. It's a daily reading of the Bible. It's a daily persuading of souls. It's a daily, we're daily fishers of men. Um, and don't take this as condemnation if you're like, I haven't witnessed in a long time. That's not what this, this is encouragement. This is just empowering. Uh, our ministry here is to equip Christians to do the work of the ministry. So receive it as you're getting equipped and strengthened so you can actually do it. Don't let the enemy come and tell you condemnation and, um, you know, feel bad because you haven't done it or whatever. It's not about the past. It's about what the Lord is building you up. So you can do moving forward. And so take it as an encouragement from the Lord. And so um, there's a contrast here um, that some, but only some. So take key note of that. Some, they were hearted. They were hearted towards the message of Jesus Christ and they did not believe. They chose not to believe. 
And they actually spoke evil of the way. They spoke evil of the way of Jesus, the way of Christianity. They spoke evil of the way. Falsely, obviously. And all who dwelt in Asia heard the words of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. So there's a contrast. Some got hardened, but at the same time, simultaneously, all. Do you know what the word all means in Greek? It means all. That means every single person who dwelt in Asia, and this is Asia Minor, this is modern day Turkey, all the people, what if all the people that live in Istanbul right now, uh, 2024, would hear the word of the Lord Jesus? Wouldn't that be amazing? Do you think all of them are going to turn to God? Some are going to hard their hearts, but if they all hear it, oh yeah, there's going to be a revival. And we're going to see that that's what happens here. And God wants to do it again. So Paul here is equipped to do what God has called him to do, what Jesus teaches us in the gospel, not to cast our pearls before swine. So those people who harden their hearts, Jesus said, hey, if they don't receive you, shake the dust off your feet, uh, move on to the next town. Somebody will receive you. You witness to them, they're responsible for that information. They want to speak evil of you as a Christian, move on. There's other people who will receive your ministry. And that's the thing, not everybody can receive our ministry. Not, you know, we don't receive everybody's ministry. So God, um, you try, you share with somebody and somebody doesn't want to hear, don't cast your pearls before swine. Those, those, don't show the pig your jewels. Like, hey, check out my gold ring, pig, because a pig cannot appreciate it. It's not my words, it's God's word. <laughs> I know it's kind of harsh. But hey, check out this diamond ring, uh, pig. Pig's like, I just want to eat. <laughs> I, I, I don't know, I, I, he doesn't have any discernment that it's gold and that it actually costs money. So you share the message, you share this gold jewel, the salvation, and people don't want it, you move on. Because guess what? Other people want it, and they're hungry, and they will receive it, and their lives will be changed. And so Paul just went on and continued to disciple and make Christians in another place. He continued to work somewhere else. So when the Lord closes one door, I love that he immediately opens another door. He opens another door uh, somewhere else, and in this case, for Paul, he opened a door in the school of Tyrannus, where he reasoned daily. This daily is just a theme. He reasoned daily. Paul was like not wasting his life. He wasn't living for getting rich and building a house and having his car paid off and having some vacations and some concert and some travel plans. This is not. This was not Paul's purpose of existence. Paul's purpose of existence was to win lost souls from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. And God took care of everything else. God took care of his food and his needs and everything until the Lord was done with him. And he said, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of the Lord. And that's what the Lord is going to do for us too. But just be encouraged that God wants to do the same thing. This is not just a book that we're reading about Paul. Oh, that was a nice story at church that, you know, that kind of tickled my ears. I felt good at some moments. This is... This is for you to be a warrior for the Lord, to get equipped and to just have purpose and direction. And I know you already do. And um, just receive it that way. So, daily. Read the Bible daily. Share your faith daily. Persuade others to come to church uh, every time uh, we meet. That's what Paul did. It's, an, uh, it's a constant in, um, engagement and a constant overflowing of the Spirit through our lives, no matter the outcome. Some will get hardened, but others will believe. So keep going in the power of the Holy Spirit. Verse 11 says, Now God worked unusual miracles. And I want you to notice it's unusual. It's not usual. It means it's not all the time. It's just some rare times. By the hands of Paul. So that even handkerchiefs or sweatbands and aprons were brought from Paul's body to the sick. And the diseases left them. And the evil spirits went out of them. So notice that evil spirits went out of them. There's, there's people that were demon-possessed. So Paul's encountering people who are possessed by devils and some who are sick. And God works unusual miracles. And the people that are sick, they get healed when they touch the sweatbands of Paul. Now, some people take this verse out of context. That's what we teach at Calvary Chapel, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, book by book. And we consider the verses in its entire context. Some people create ministries, which they're not ministries. They take off their jackets and they slap people with their jackets for healing and people fall back in the spirit. Well, that type of activity and that type of practice is not biblical because we don't see it in the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. We never see anybody. 
In this particular case, there was unusual miracles that happened. It's a rare thing that God did. God was merciful. And so the people, in this case, just activated their faith at the point of contact. They, they Remember the woman at the well? She was bleeding for 12 years, and she said, if I touch Jesus' garment, she decided that. If I can just touch, I'm going to meet my well. That was her point of contact. But the rest of the Bible doesn't teach that you need to go and touch people. You know, it was just, it, was just, it just happened like a one-time type of deal, once in a while. And God is merciful to the people. God is going to meet us where we're at. That's all, whatever we know, and we activate our faith some way, somehow, regardless if it was done this way or that way, God is just so good. And he had mercy on the woman. And so they activate their uh, faith here. Um, but just so you know, the sweatbands actually don't have any power in themselves. And I know you already know that, to heal. Um, it was just it was just an unusual miracles. Some people actually, I, I heard that they actually sell uh, sweatbands. Some uh, preachers, right? And you can buy the sweatbands on TV and then you're going to get a healing. You're going to get a blessing. That's just abuse of the scripture. And that is not rightly dividing the word of God. And there will be account accountability. That's why he says, let not many of you be teachers knowing that you will receive the stricter judgment. And so, woe uh, to the people who do that. Verse 13, it says, then some of the Iterian Jewish exorcists. This is weird. There's people like exorcists trying to cast out demons. Here's what they did. So these people are not Christians, okay? These exorcists, they're not, these ghostbusters. You know, we make a movie out of it and it's cute and we laugh, you know, but there's, there's a, like a, a re, satanic reality behind it. So these, these non-Christian, non-born again, not filled with the Holy Spirit people, they said, we're going to cast out demons out of other people. <laughs> okay, let's see how this plays out. So some of the Iterian Jews, exorcists, took it upon themselves now, we don't want to take the ministry upon ourselves. We want what the Lord tells us. We don't, want to, we don't want to be the driving force of the ministry. But these guys, they were the driving force. They took it upon themselves. They're not Christians. And they took it upon themselves to call on the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, here's what these people said. We exercise you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. And there were uh, seven sons of uh, Shiva, a Jewish chief priest, who did so. So these people were doing this. The sons of Shiva were not Christians. They did not have a relationship with Jesus, but they're trying to uh, imitate what they saw other Christians do. And so they tried to cast out demons out of people. And what I have to say to that is good luck with that. Good luck with that, that the demons are gonna obey uh, that. The demons actually jump out, beat up these people, and they flee out naked. So my encouragement for us is that we would not mess around with any form of darkness because it is real. I only recommend staying close to Jesus. And when the devil comes knocking at your door looking for you, just ask Jesus. Jesus, do you mind just get the door for me? Answer the door. Always keep Jesus between you and the devil. Because the devil is a defeated foe in front of Jesus. But if you don't let Jesus... Be that for you, and you go against the devil, then we're the defeated foe if we face the devil ourselves. So we don't face the devil. We just go behind Jesus. We let him deal with it. And so in verse 15, it says, The evil spirit, so that means a demon, answered. He, the demon actually spoke. Here's what the demon said. Jesus I know. Paul I know. But who are you? <laughs> You have no authority. you tell telling me what to do. You think I answered to you? The demon said, you think I answered to you? You're not even a Christian. I know Jesus. If Jesus tells me to go into the pig and go down into the water, I have to obey. Because the winds obey Jesus. Nature obeys Jesus. Everything obeys Jesus. So if Jesus directly tells a demon to do something, they have to obey. But you think I'm going to obey you, the devil says? Who are you? You're nobody. You're not even born again of the Spirit of God. You're not even a Christian. That's, that's the devil, <laughs> demon's words. And the men in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them. Man, I don't want no demon leaping on me. We're Christians. But does this happen? Yes. The Bible is true. It's the word of God. The demon leaped on them, overpowered them, prevailed against them, so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. The demon beat them up physically. They were wounded. They, this demon wounded them. 
But God even used this to draw people to himself. Right? Jesus says, don't be lukewarm. You either for me or against me. You either gather with me or you scatter, scatter abroad. People who are like one foot in the church, one foot in the world. I'm kind of with Jesus. You know, um, I talked to somebody this week, you know, and uh, she had one of the most foul mouths you would ever hear. Just cussing here, cussing there, everything. Cuss, cuss, cuss. 90% of her words. And then she says, well, you know, I'm a Christian and I repent of my sins. So, yeah, you know, I do this and I cheat here and I do that, but I just repent. All right. So she's mad. I'm not making this up. This was actually yesterday. OK, so this is a conversation I had yesterday. And so um, that's where some people are. So because the demon came out and prevailed against these people who are exorcists, great power you have in your own strength, they got beat up. <laughs> Don't mess around with devils. We're born again. Let Jesus get the door for you. But because of this, both all the Jews and the Greeks who dwelt, who lived in, in the city of Ephesus, and fear fell on them, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. So God even used this situation, this darkness. That's what Jesus says, I'd rather you be hot or cold. Because if you're cold, you're going to experience cold. In other words, darkness and the devil. You're going to experience that. And hopefully, you see how bad it is? Then you run to Jesus. Eventually, you repent and you turn and you're born again. So I'd rather you be there because you're closer to heaven away from God than being in the middle in this lukewarm state where you think you're okay. Like the lady I was having a conversation with yesterday. I'm a Christian. I just repented my sins. Boom, 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 boom. And that was not, I, I'm, I, I'm sparing you 99% of the other sins that she was sharing uh, about. And so that is a dangerous place to be in because Jesus is going to, if we're like that, and any of us have the potential to go there. So we're not any better than anybody else. Jesus is going to spit us out of his mouth. But if we're hot and on fire for the Lord, then we're good because we're saved and we're truly empowered by the Holy Spirit. But it's better to just be far away because at least you know your need. You know, you know what it is and you can make a distinction and you can make a difference. So the Lord used even this situation when the demon jumped out and beat some people up that the fear of God fell upon them and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified and people turned to the Lord when they heard that what this evil thing that had happened. So what about you and me? Do we turn to the Lord? Are we obedient to the Lord through his still small voice? God tells us something. Are we just obedient or does the Lord need to like increase the pressure on us to really kind of get us in the direction he wants us to go? You know, even with my kids, you tell them, I don't want you to do that. You know, one of my kids is like, okay, daddy. He obeys right away. That pleases the father, right? The other kid just argues and reasons and no and this and that, right? So guess what? Well, a kind word didn't work. So you have to try a different tactic. Because <laughs> you have to protect these kids. They don't know what they're doing, right? God's protecting us. We don't know what we're doing. We're the kids in that situation. So what does God have to bring? You know, for me... I was very stubborn and I heard about Jesus and I believed it, but I didn't want Jesus because I believed at the moment that I received Jesus that God is going to make me have a bad life. That was the lie that I believed in my head. I didn't believe that God was good and that God had, I just believed what happened that he died on the cross, but I didn't want to repent. I don't want to change my life. I wanted to live for pleasure, for the world. I wanted to live for me. I wanted to be in control. Okay, so I didn't listen gently through the still small voice. And so the Lord allowed my cheekbone to be broken, somebody's forehead to hit my cheekbone and to shatter my right cheekbone and to end up in the hospital on a stretcher, on a deathbed, when the doctor said I might die um, at the age of 17 or I might be in a wheelchair for the rest of my life. And God had to bring me to that place where I said, Lord, if you're real, reveal yourself to me. Now I have surgery in my face and I have 13 titanium plates in my face. They reconstructed my face. Now, why didn't I just listen and follow the Lord? Why did it have to be like that? Because I'm very stubborn, but God is very merciful. So sometimes it's better to, you know, just like that little sheep that always goes astray from the shepherd. The little sheep doesn't know there's wolves waiting to eat the sheep. Right? Sometimes the 
good shepherd, and I emphasize good shepherd, breaks the sheep's leg so the sheep cannot run away and die. It's better to have a broken leg than to be dead. And then the shepherd carries that sheep on his back for the whole healing process, a month, two months, three months, a year. And while that sheep is with the shepherd, that sheep learns who the shepherd is. And that sheep's, oh, God is good. God is love. God loves me. God cares about me. I don't need to. I don't need to venture out into the world. I don't need to try this sin. I don't need to try and fulfill myself like this. All I need is Jesus. You know, the Bible says uh, at his right hand, there's pleasures forevermore. So that sheep learns that the good shepherd is good. And so when the shepherd puts that sheep down after the leg was healed, that sheep never strays away because the, sh the, sh the sheep know his voice. So what does it take for me and you to obey the, Lord, the word of the Lord? I pray that from this moment on, we just listen. Just like one of my kids, when I say do this, yes, daddy. <laughs> what, what is God telling me? What is God telling you? What is our attitude? Yes, daddy. Yes, heavenly father. Or is it, no, God, but you're not that smart, God. You don't know. I know better. Like, what about this? Are, are we arguing with them? Do we, are we really that arrogant? And I don't know any of you guys, but I just know I'm sinful. <laughs> so we all have tendencies. Right? We're all different, but we all have tendencies to go there. So avoid that. Just, yes, Daddy, Father knows best. God's primary way to relate to us is through His loving kindness, and He draws us to repentance. But from time to time, He will even use a situation like this, when the demon jumped out and beat those people up, to draw all men to Himself. And verse 18 says, And many who have believed came, confessing and telling their deeds. Also many of those who have practiced magic brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all so that they counted up the value of them and it totaled 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of God grew and multiplied and prevailed. So people repented. The demon came out. The demon beat up some people. Everybody gossiped about it. Everybody heard about it. Then people are like, oh, I need the Lord. Okay, I'm sorry, Lord. So there's a big revival. People get saved. Then the people who are doing magic, magic is demonic. They're like, okay, here's my magic book. Here's my Ouija board. And they throw it all into a bonfire and they burn it. And there's so much devilish stuff because people are demon possessed. There's so much darkness in Ephesus at this time. There was 50,000 uh, pieces of silver. I don't know how much a piece of silver is. I'm sure you can, we can figure it out. But 50,000, it was just a ton. It was just a lot. And all of that was repented of. So true belief in Jesus equals conversion. These people converted. We believe that the Lord Jesus, that, that, that Jesus is Lord, and we confess our sins, and he forgives us of our sins. We tell him we're sorry, that we've done evil against him, and, and didn't live the way he wanted us to live. We ask him for forgiveness, and we stop living the wrong way, and we start living the right way. I was told that here in town, there's a magic store here on the beach. And as innocent as that sounds, they have a right to be in business. I wouldn't mess with anything that's magic. Because there's evil spirits that are involved with that. So the things that are written here in the Bible, they're written for our learning. And so I would rather pray for the owner of the magic book, uh, magic store in town, and for the people that are buying stuff at that store here in Panama City Beach that they would be drawn to the Lord by his loving kindness and they too will bring their magic books and everything that I have in the sight of all and that they would burn them and destroy them and not believe in that. And so they can be spared from a demon jumping on them and beating them up because the, de the demons didn't stop doing this. We're learning this. They're still trying to destroy people's lives. A quick story where I'm from in California there's UCLA, everybody's heard of UCLA. There's a Irvine campus, it's called UCI. It's a, a, a university, it's a medical center, it's a training where a lot of physicians get their training, they become doctors there and they have all kinds of stuff. Well, in Orange County, where I moved from a, a month ago, there's 3.16 million people there in Orange County. But the epicenter of magic is at the University of California, Irvine, in their library. 
They have the most magic books. And this is a university. This is for a higher learning. This is the leaders of the future of America. And even I have family members that are considering going and attending and enrolling in University of California, Irvine. So I give you a warning that is the epicenter of darkness and it's real and do with that information as you may. But I love you and the Lord loves you and we don't want anything bad to happen to you. Now, when before I was a Christian, I would listen to secular music myself. So I don't just want to beat up on people. I want to, okay, how about me? How about you, Christian? How about you? Are you repenting? I used to listen to, when I was not a Christian, to CDs. You guys, anybody remember CDs? <laughs> I used to listen to CDs with fall, uh, filthy lyrics, bad stuff. I was not a Christian. But when I became a Christian, I broke the CDs and I threw them away. I did just as these people in Ephesus did. They took their magic books and they threw them in the bonfire and they repented, right? So I did my <coughs> repentance. And I know it's nobody in this room. It's mostly for our online audience, uh, joking. But what about you? Is there anything? Is God showing us anything? We should always search ourselves. Is there anything that I need to get rid of out of my life? Is there anything that I need to bring to the cross? So when these things were accomplished, and burning anything that's evil in your life is a true accomplishment. You want to have an accomplishment? You want to have an accomplished day? Burn anything that's evil in your life. Paul purposed in the spirit when he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia to go to Jerusalem. And he said, after I've been there, I, might, I must also see Rome. So he sent into Macedonia two of those who ministered to him, Timothy and Erastus. But he himself stayed in Asia for a time. And, and about that time, there rose a commotion about the way. And so the way was the, this way of life that Christians were living, that were following Jesus. And it was obvious to unbelievers that Christians were different because they were living like Jesus. And now in verse 24, it says, A certain man, his name is Demetrius, and he is a silversmith. He makes silver. Um, remember, they brought their books and it totaled... 50,000 of silver. He was making these little silver um, idols. Okay. So he made silver shrines of Diana and brought no small profit to the craftsmen. So it was, a, it was a very lucrative business. Demetrius was making a boatload of money but making little figurines of, of silver uh, of this sex goddess Diana and he was selling it to so many people. So many people became ri rich by creating evil things and bringing it into the world. And they do that even in our world today. And the reason is, is because sex appeals to the flesh and people just buy it up. The people are going to, um, these people that kind of create this evil are, are some of our strongest opponents to Christianity and to us as Christians. They're gonna fight us the most. They're gonna fight us sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. Um, because telling people don't spend money on sexual content means that they lose money and so they're going to fight against us any way they can and they don't like that and so they're going to try to make us to stop witnessing and they're going to try to make us to stop speaking for the truth but we're not going to do that so in verse 25 this Demetrius this evil guy he called them together he called other people that were doing the same thing, other workers in similar occupation, and Demetrius said to these other people, he, he, he started a riot, he's starting commotions, and he's starting to fight against Paul and the Christianity. He says, here's what he says, men, you know that we have our prosperity by this trade. Selling sex, we make money. You guys wanna lose money? Come on, do something about it. Moreover, you see in here, not only in Ephesus, but throughout all Asia, this Paul was persuaded and turned many people saying that they're not gods which are made with hands. So not only is this trait of ours in danger of falling into disrepute, but also the temple of the great goddess Diana may be dismissed and of her magnificence destroyed whom all Asia and all the world worship. Isn't that scary? All Asia, meaning all Turkey and all the world worship the god of sex. All right? Does that sound like a 
times we're living in today? I love the story of Billy Sunday. Some of you guys heard of Billy Sunday. He used to be a professional baseball player, got saved, and he was an evangelist. And Billy Sunday would preach with such conviction that people in the whole city would repent. And then the people that had bars, they would have to shut down because they couldn't sell the alcohol to anybody. Nobody would come and buy them anymore. So he turned the whole city upside down. He did it in the biblical times. He did it in Billy Sunday's times. And God wants to do it again today. But we have to, we have to address it. You know, here in Panama City Beach, you know, it's known for being the spring break capital of the world. People come here from all over the place to worship this great goddess Diana too. Even if we're in denial, it happens. Every, everybody knows that even the secular MTV filled series of spring break parties here in Panama City Beach. I'm telling you, I, I just came from Orange County, so I can tell you what the world thinks when you say Panama City Beach. When I talked to people a couple months ago, I'm moving to Panama City Beach. Oh, they know what it is. It's the spring break capital of the world. That's what the world knows it as. I'm telling you what the outside knows it as. And so, not you guys, but people come all over the world here for, for, for that, to worship the great goddess Diana. They're doing it today. But ultimately, this is going to destroy these people's lives. And I care enough about it to speak against it. They might have fun for a little brief moment. But we as a church, we care enough to share the truth and love because we love them. And God does not want that for them. God wants to spare them. And God wants to draw them into themselves. To himself. So in verse 20 it says, Now when they heard this, they were full of wrath and cried out, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. And so for Demetrius, it was all about the money. And a lot of our world is corrupt and it's all about the money. Their moral system revolves around, if I tell the truth today, is that going to make me money? Yes, then they tell the truth. Tomorrow, is lying going to make me money? Yes, lying is going to make you money. Then they lie. They have no firm foundation. We as Christians, our firm foundation is Jesus Christ. And we know from the Ten Commandments that lying is wrong at all times under all circumstances. So we have a firm foundation. We don't choose to tell the truth or to lie based on what's going to make me money. But that's how a lot of the world operates, especially people who are, um, they harden themselves to the Lord. So the whole city was filled with confusion, verse 29, and they rushed into the theater with one accord, having seized Gaius and Aristarchus, Macedonians. These people were Paul's travel companions. And when Paul wanted to go into the people, the disciples would not allow him. And some of the officials of Asia, who were his friends, sent to him, pleading that he would not venture into the theater. Some therefore cried one thing and some another, for the assembly was confused, and most of them did not know that they had why they had come together. So notice that the crowd that's rioting is so confused. The Bible says that confusion does not come from the Lord. We as Christians, as born again, spirit-filled Christians, we're not confused people. But people are not spirit-filled Christians. They're confused and they're rioting. They don't even know why they're rioting. They don't know what they're rioting. That reminds me of a couple of years ago when we had the lockdowns. People were smashing, grabbing stores and rioting and they don't even know what they're doing. If you interview them, they don't know why they're there. It's because it's a mob. Everybody's doing it. It's the herd mentality. You know, they're jumping off the cliffs. I'm here about to jump off the cliff too. Especially in LA, they were doing that and all over. And so the child of God is not confused. So you can praise God for that. That God is not the author of confusion. Verse 33. And they drew Alexander out of the multitudes and the Jews put him forward. And Alexander motioned with his hand and wanted to make his offense to the people. And when they found out that he was a Jew, with one voice they cried out for about two hours. These people sound sane to you or insane. They were shouting for two hours. Great is Diana of the Ephesians. Great is Diana of the Ephesians. What kind of mindset is that? Great is the God of sex. Great is the God of sex. Leave us alone, Christians. Don't preach Jesus. We don't want you. That's, that's 2024 translation. That's what it says. They shouted for two hours. Great is Diana of the Ephesians. And basically, like the mayor, the city clerk, he basically broke up this riot and nothing came out of it. Praise God. 
When the city clerk, verse 35, had quieted the crowd, he said, Men of Ephesus, what man is there who does not know that the city of the Ephesians is temple guardian of the great goddess Diana and of the image which fell down from Zeus? Therefore, since these things cannot be denied, you ought to be quiet and do nothing rashly. So after two hours of chanting, this, this city clerk, this mayor type of a person who's not a Christian, he breaks up the riot and he encourages the people. If you have a problem with somebody, use the court system. Um, and he sends everybody home. And in verse 37 says, For you have brought these men here who are neither robbers of temple nor blasphemers of your goddess. Now I'm speaking of Paul. Therefore, if Demetrius, this troublemaker, and his fellow craftsmen have a case against anyone, the courts are open, and their proconsuls, their judges, let them bring the charge against one another. But if you have another inquiry to make, it shall be determined in the lawful assembly. Go to court if you want to figure this out. We're not doing it by fighting and just having this flash mob. For we are in danger of being called into question for today's uproar, there being no reason which we may give to account for the disorderly gather gathering. And when they had said these things, he dismissed the assembly. So that's Acts chapter 19. So Paul was a fighter. <laughs> he contended. But that's what Jude tells us. Jude is the half-brother of Jesus. And Jude says, contend earnestly for the faith which was once and for all delivered to you. Don't you praise God that the faith was delivered to us? It is our responsibility to contend. If we don't contend for the faith, who's going to contend? Who's going to contend? So we need the Holy Spirit to contend, to speak the truth in love because we love people. We don't want people's lives to be destroyed. We want them to be blessed. We don't want them to have the experiences with darkness and to get beat up by darkness and get robbed and all this kind of stuff. And so... May the Lord bring revival in our city, in our church, in me. May he just do a fresh work of his Holy Spirit. If you want prayer for the Holy Spirit to empower you, you can come up front and we'll pray for you that the Lord will do it. He will do it. He will empower you. And um, what we do here.